Um, my name is Hilary Greenbaum. I'm the director of graphic design, wow, that's bright, um, for the Whitney. Um, how many of you have actually been to our new building, which is right down the street? Awesome. Um, so for those who do not know, the Whitney Museum of American Art um, has been displaying uh, modern and contemporary art since the 1930s, um, but we opened our new building downtown in the Meatpacking District last May, so about a year ago. And for most of that time, um, since the 30s, the visitor experience has pretty much looked like this. Someone viewing and engaging with an artwork um, with or without the striped t-shirt. But in more recent years, this has also become pretty normal. Um, people engaging with art and the museum itself, for that matter, through the lens of their smartphone um, and sharing those pictures on Instagram and other social media platforms. So much so that in one of the reviews of our new building, they actually called us the Instagram of museums, and we haven't even touched on art selfies. Um, so I could show you a bunch of professionally shot portfolio pics to kind of show what my small department did to contribute to the opening of the new building and beyond. Um, but I realized that the public has actually documented our work in a far more interesting way. Um, I don't know what a coconut is doing on top of our digital sign here, but I kind of like it. It's weird. Um, so fueled by countless hours of trolling Instagram, I'd like to share with you only what's already been deemed worthy of sharing. Um, so I'd say about, what is it now, three years ago, uh, we rebranded. Um, so that's a full two years in advance of opening our new building. And you might be sitting there thinking, why did you do that? Why would you rebrand? Why not just do it all at once when you open the new building? And there are two reasons we chose to do it early. One being that it was going to be a lot of change for our constituents, a new building, a new neighborhood, lots and lots of change. So we thought it might be a little too much. Um, and then the second reason, which is a more logistical reason, was these elevator buttons. For those who've been to our new building, we actually have four custom elevators that are all artworks by the late artist Richard Archwater. And we actually had to give Otis, um, the elevator company, designs for the buttons, uh, yeah, like two years in advance of opening. So um, either we were going to design everything, have this, to have this building all kind of baked in with our identity system, either we were gonna design it two years in advance and kind of like hold on to it for two years, which would never actually happen, or just kind of get it out there and have it serve as kind of a mascot for upcoming change, which is what we did. So six months after rebranding, um, we threw the keys to our uptown location to the Met, which has already reopened. Um, and we were dark for about six months after that until the new building opened. So most of our work at that time was only visible on the streets. So this bus shelter was part of a large marketing campaign that we basically made reproductions of some of the most popular works in our collection and then reshot them in and around the meatpacking district to kind of build momentum. Um, so this one features Roy Lichtenstein's girl in window as shot in a window off the High Line. You can kind of see a detail of that. Um, this is Edward Hopper's early Sunday, Monday, early Sunday morning on a subway poster. And you can kind of get a sense, I'm gonna assume for that most of you are designers and have seen what our identity system looks like, but it's basically this word Whitney within this line-based W, um, and that W responds differently to its environment. And in this circumstance, it's dipping into the picture frame to re respond to the artwork in that frame. Here's another version of a subway poster featuring uh, George Tucker's um, subway as photographed in a subway station and then reproduced on a subway poster that ran in the subway station. Um, so a bunch of people actually tagged the person coming up the stairs in this picture. It's like, hey, Judy, that's totally you. Um, one woman actually called our marketing department multiple times, insisting that it was her daughter-in-law um, and that she deserved a copy of the poster. Um, unfortunately for her, it's me. Um, so <laughs> it's the start and end of my modeling career. Never believe a photographer when they say you'll just be blurry. Um, Cindy Sherman helped out with this one, um, and then when our buy was up, she graciously held to advertise it too, <laughs> most likely unknowingly. Um, the marketing campaign uh, carried on in a few locations without any imagery, such as these stairs um, in the subway station at 8th and 14th, um, as well as an animated banner that ran in Times Square. Uh, we also did some traditional print media placements, such as this full page ad in the New York Times, which ran uh, the week before we opened. And the day we opened, this was the largest um, implementation we had done today, which was this billboard off the High Line. Um, 
We also commandeered every street pole banner in the meatpacking district with a mini campaign that joined Works from Our Collection with uh, local businesses. So at Roche's um, Standard Station Amarillo, Texas meets Standard Hotel. Um, Atlantic Theater meets Everett Chin's Classic Painting the Review. Um, and my personal favorite, uh, Christian Louboutin, famed shoemaker, is introduced to Tom Wesselton's Seascape Number 15, which is as you can see, a gigantic foot. Um, and what I love most about this picture is that it was actually taken and posted by the estate of Tom Wesselman. Um, so while we were doing all these things to gain momentum with the public, we also wanted to keep artists who are our core constituency in the loop by redesigning and redistributing our artist lifetime pass, which is something that every artist in the collection gets. We also made a limited edition founding membership card for those who joined as members um, in the year leading up to the opening. Um, kind of featured this fun black on black printing to make it feel pretty exclusive. Uh, we started pushing these uh, while we were still in Boyer and uh, they were still available on our website uh, with or without dogs. Uh, um, while we were dark, members were invited to a number of lectures and events um, to keep them interested. They also were able to get into the building before anyone else was um, when we opened downtown. I love this picture because this member just laid out all of our work uh, so considerately. You can kind of get a sense of what I mean uh, with our responsive debut system that it kind of changes with each application. Um, for members, or high level members who are getting multiple inv invites simultaneously, we created this string-based responsive W that could neatly house a number of materials. And if you're a really uh, VIP, you got one of these, which was an invite to the dedication of the building where uh, the keynote speaker was the First Lady Michelle Obama, who looked great. Cows are kind of framed by our signage. Um, and when you approach the building, the first thing you see are these digital blades, as we call them. There's two of them. They have two main functions, one to announce that we are the Whitney and two to kind of advertise what's on view. So there are these animations, the first suite of which we worked with Experimental Jet Set, who we worked with on the rebranding, fantastic trio of Dutch designers. Um, and we were concerned at that point because we were the only, the only digital signage in the neighborhood was this. So we had to kind of toe that line between interesting and engaging um, without being kind of too loud or obnoxious. Um, so thankfully, they worked out pretty well. People seem to really like them. Um, these are artists performing with our digital song. Um, so people really like them or they just find them soothing, take a nap in front of them. Um, this girl is really excited to find our uh, towers, which are posted by the front door. But this kid is super excited because she was one of the first group in the door the day we opened. Um, she's holding on to our tickets, which we also worked on the pre-printed uh, base stock of the tickets, as well as all the digital templates that kind of output all the information on it. Um, and it's interesting, the functional nature of a ticket is pretty self-explanatory. You pay money, you show it, and then you get in. Um, but on Instagram, there's so many of these pictures. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that had, um, the ticket has weirdly become this, you know, physical emoji to kind of timestamp you in an exact location. Um, same for the museum guide, tons of these pictures too. Obviously, the function of the museum guide is pretty self-explanatory too. It helps you navigate the building, figure out what's on view. Even if you can't read, you can apparently understand it. Um, and secondarily, as an eye mask for when you want to take an afternoon nap, apparently it's the perfect size. Um, but in terms of how we wanted to communicate information throughout the building, you kind of see the, the back of the museum guide has this plan with these kind of graphic numbers paired with information for that floor. Um, we continued that same framework with our digital signage, which exists in the elevators and outside the elevators on every gallery floor, so you can quickly figure out um, where you are and what you can see. Um, same for the large digital sign within our lobby and the physical signs and all of the stairwells. So, um, you can figure out pretty quickly where you can go um, and where you can't go. Um, so within the museum, the responsive W turns into a responsive arrow, um, which this savvy visitor figured out pretty quickly. Um, and there's a further linear reduction for the markings on the glass that prevent you from breaking your nose. Um, uh, Noi House for Test, which is our house typeface, is used on all of our signage, including um, the stuff that the city makes us put up. Uh, thank you to Christian Schwartz for designing such a nice font um, and for taking this picture and posting it. I also volunteered to do the fire safety maps, uh, which are kind of 
kind of boring, I'd say, but um, I like to believe when I'm this woman's age, they'll still be there. Uh, we also thanked our generous donors throughout the building with donor signage. Um, also on the glass, um, when you first approach the building, I like to believe that someone was taking a picture of our beautiful typesetting and James Spader just happened to get in the way. Uh, we also created a comprehensive stanchion signage system that is housed on our staff site, so regardless of whether or not I or someone from my team is on site, um, someone from the staff can output it and get it up there as fast as possible. I was actually hoping with most of our digital signage we could get rid of this type of signage. I actually find it very um, intrusive in you know, your visitor experience. Um, but for certain things like this, please do not sit or touch on this sculpture. That's really kind of the best way. It literally serves as a stop sign most of the time. Um, uh, but really the only sign people want is this. <laughs> if you've ever worked in a museum, really this is all people want. Um, and gestures of inclusion can go a long way. This is actually our most photographed sign. So we worked on all the exhibition graphics as we do for every exhibition. This is actually silk screened directly onto the wall, um, as are all the small or um, explanatory text throughout the galleries. Um, and the object labels, we work on those two, the small ones that are next to each piece with all the didactic information, um, and even some of these handheld ones for when uh, works were too tightly hung. And for those following the multimedia guide, the stop numbers are at the bottom of those labels. We designed the interface for that, for both adults and children. Um, and while the experience of that may be mixed, <laughs> um, uh, we designed a lot of things for kids uh, to help make up for it, um, including some just basic signage for the open studios. I love that some kid drew like a script version of our logo. Um, and also activity guides uh, for each major exhibition. And while they're working away on that in the galleries, which is super sweet to see, uh, we made something just for their parents um, after taking them around the museum. Um, in addition to all of the Whitney-based materials, we also partnered with Union Square Hospitality Group on the identity for both restaurants within the building. So this is for the Studio Cafe. These are the menus that's on the eighth floor. And that's the logo for that. Um, so when you're dealing with a very minimalist identity, smooth, uh, identity system, small moves can kind of go a long way. Um, creating this shape um, around the Studio Cafe words not only kind of mirrors the shape of the cafe itself, but allows us a platform to knock out the type, which is something that doesn't happen anywhere else in the building. Uh, we also did the logo type for Untitled, which is basically the same font, but upper and lower with an underline, um, and the menus for that. Uh, and not to forget the Whitney Shop, we also designed a lot of materials for retail, um, including uh, the shopping bags, which have a wraparound responsive W, and this limited edition tote bag we made for the opening, which pairs kind of the linear elements of our identity system with the facade of the building and your, you know, basics, postcards, travel mugs, embroidered baseball caps, which this guy had experimental jet set sign, which is hilarious, um, standard stationary materials like pens and erasers, uh, lately we've been also making some posters. We did this for Frank Stella, which uh, ran over this past winter. Um, and we also worked on a book, this 432-page monster, uh, which is the handbook for our collection. So more recently, after the opening, um, we continue to work on every exhibition that's there, including this one um, for Laura Quattris, which you have probably heard of through her film series, um, most notably Citizen Four. Um, she created a really great exhibition, actually, that um, was a series of small, dark rooms, um, very experiential, touching on a lot of really heavy topic topics like occupation and torture and surveillance. Um, and because of the low light level throughout the exhibition, no one could have read um, the standard material what we would have put up there, like the object labels, so we made this for sure, um, which from a distance looks a little cryptic, uh, looks kind of like a puzzle that needs to be solved, but in the um, same vein as some of the hidden in plain sight aspects of what she was exploring within the exhibition, this is basically just the floor plan of the exhibition itself. Um, we also worked on the marketing campaign for that um, at the time because it was um, a very experiential based exhibition. There, there was nothing really to show yet. Uh, this slit of light is representational of a series of them that existed in a room where you would kind of peek into them um, and see uh, a bunch of documents and videos. But at the time, all we had was a small box in her studio. So we actually staged a photo shoot. I, refused to be in this one. This is our head of visitor experience. Um, 
And it's interesting to see this, how it kind of played out um, in some print ads and on the subway. And while I was kind of doing ongoing research on Instagram, um, I noticed that people were taking their own photographs that kind of mirrored what we had done for the marketing campaign. And a few of them here and there, you know, sure, it's a very graphic part of the show, but um, there were so many that it was hard to kind of ignore that our way of representing the show also um, kind of inspired people who were also visiting the same thing, um, which is really interesting. So at the end of the day, uh, the graphic design department at the Whitney kind of exists at the crossroads between um, the artists we foster and the visitors we welcome, and our identity system serves as a responsive voice to both parties, um, and hopefully giving context to the art so that people can find something that speaks directly to them, um, or that they find inspiring. Um, and unlike you know, a job at a studio um, working in-house, uh, is a job that's kind of never over. Um, each, each project builds upon the last and hopefully over time the brand has its own narrative and it's kind of that big picture struggle that I actually find most interesting about my job and hopefully if I'm doing it well enough you find it interesting too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? Uh, well, I have one. Uh, so, how do you design for how do you design for a new audience of so millennials? How do you think about that? Well, our audience is pretty wide. Um, we have everyone from kids to grandparents at our museum, so it's hard to really focus on just building just one audience. Um, I think what ties them together is an interest in art um, and trying to speak to everyone in anyone on, on who has that interest. I think that's what's actually pretty great about our identity system in that it puts art forward. Um, our identity system is primarily just black and white, allowing the artworks that we use in any context to be the color. Um, so we're, I mean, it's kind of less about, you know, speaking to, in a specific voice, it's kind of more speaking in an authentic voice about um, what shows we have on view, what we're trying to do as an institution. Uh, thank you. I think the W is, is fantastic, it's iconic, and I'm curious where in the development process did that come into the picture and how much, if any, did that drive additional design and brand considerations? Um, the responsive W itself, like the idea of it being like changeable, is that what you're asking about? Yeah, um, we, it was a two-year process, actually, t from start to finish, in terms of researching firms to work with, to seeing four pitches from four firms, and then hiring Experimental Jet Set, and um, that actually wasn't their pitch. Um, so we worked with them uh, to develop what ended up being what we have now. Um, a long time. The anti-startup. <laughs> You have time for maybe one more? With the building itself? With the building, with the building itself? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like signage, it's, it's interesting hearing about, you know, testing, testing, testing about UX. Um, for a lot of my projects, you just gotta make a decision and get it up there. Um, there really isn't a whole lot of user testing that can be done with signage. Like, the building needed to open and people needed to find out where they needed to go. So we, you know, worked with uh, an outside consultant, we did our best, um, but there are definitely problems, some of them, uh, insurmountable with the building itself, but some that we're trying to kind of resolve now, like fi figuring out where the pinch points are and trying to either add signage or change the amount of information that we're giving to someone at a certain area. Um, so it's, it's an ongoing process. But yeah, there's definitely, you know, it's, it's a constant evolution. Awesome. 
Thank you very much.